Uh, thank you for the, the welcome. I am a urologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and I'm actually one of very few surgeons at Memorial Sloan Kettering who is not a cancer surgeon. I, uh, I focus on quality of life surgery and uh, am in the voiding function center. So I see patients throughout Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, who have been diagnosed and are partway through or finished with treatment, with their cancer treatment, and we're focusing on quality of life and improving voiding function. I work a lot with prostate cancer patients, and I work with patients throughout the spectrum of prostate therapy, whether it's patients who simply have an elevated PSA that's being monitored, patients who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer and they're on active surveillance, and then patients who are undergoing or have completed their treatment for prostate cancer. And I see patients throughout that spectrum. And voiding function is a really important part of that whole process. Uh, and, and working with those patients to talk about where were, where were your voiding symptoms and where would you like to be and, and can we get you there. So in in the first group of patients, the patients who have an elevated PSA or perhaps have been diagnosed with uh, low volume prostate cancer and are on active surveillance, there are a number of urinary concerns that can start to present themselves. And, and these present themselves in the general population as well. Things like urinary frequency and urgency, the beginnings of obstructive urinary symptoms, slow flow, urinary hesitancy, and even at its most extreme, urinary retention. And so seeing those patients uh, who are kind of early in the journey and discussing you know, a thorough history and physical examination, uh, looking at their, uh, their urinary symptoms, doing things like an IPSS score, which is an objective measure, uh, a questionnaire that gives us objective data about the person's urinary symptoms so that we can uh, track them but also see what's the most bothersome concern that they have looking at how well they're emptying their bladder, uh, and then looking at some more objective findings, such as uh, doing studies like Eurodynamics, which is a avoiding function study that evaluates exactly what the muscular function of the bladder is. So okay, you're having these urinary symptoms. Are they attributed to some dysfunction within the bladder? Is it how your bladder's interacting with your prostate, or is it a combination of both? And then studies like cystoscopy, which is looking with a small camera into the bladder and evaluating the health of the bladder, as well as the arc inside architecture of the prostate and how the two are, are working together. For those patients who are in sort of early in the journey with elevated PSA or low volumes of prostate cancer, typically their symptoms fall into one of two categories. They can be irritative urinary symptoms, and that's the going more frequently than you'd like to with more urgency than you want, and even sometimes leaking small amounts of urine as you're trying to make it to the bathroom, and then the obstructive urinary symptoms where you're having trouble getting the urine beyond the prostate. Uh, and the first set of symptoms can be evaluated in the ways that I described and then treated with things like pelvic floor muscle training, treated with medications, uh, and even sometimes doing injections of things like Botox into the bladder. Um, the obstructive symptoms are often managed with things like a transurethral resection of prostate or medications, so very similar to patients who are not dealing with prostate cancer. The, other, the next group of patients that I'll see in my practice are patients who have been treated for prostate cancer. And so the, the first group I'll talk about are the patients who've had a radical prostatectomy. For those patients, they're primarily seeing me because they're having leakage of urine. That's the, the most common urinary symptom that I see when someone's had a radical prostatectomy. And when I sit down and discuss the reasons for that with patients, when the prostate, men have two rings of muscle in series in their urethra. One ring of muscle is inside the prostate, and the second ring of muscle is beyond the prostate. And so when the prostatectomy is performed, that ring of muscle that's inside the prostate is removed completely, and men are left with a single ring of muscle. And that's why, all of a sudden, this, the urinary control becomes such an issue. You're dealing with one fewer muscle sphincter or ring of muscle. So when we're trying to treat that, uh, the leakage of urine that occurs after the prostate is removed, 
the initial therapies are typically focused on strengthening the, rema the remaining muscle. You know, this is, this is what you have and, and how are we going to make it stronger. Most people have at least heard the word Kegel exercises or ke sometimes said Kegel exercises. And, uh, and I hear some laughter and I think that's um, maybe a good response. In general, you know, those muscles can, can be strengthened, but I think what's not appreciated is how subtle those exercises are. And so in general, if I have a patient who's interested in strengthening what muscle fibers they have, I think it's worth their time to work with a pelvic floor physical therapist. Because I've found that really the only patients who know how to activate their pelvic floor are patients who have an, a really robust yoga practice. Because those are the people who are activating their pelvic floor as part of the balance postures. The rest of us, we, you know, we just don't think about our pelvic floor. And so working with someone who is an expert in saying those are the right muscles, yes, you're activating them, and here's some exercises beyond kegels that can be helpful. Uh, I think it's worth the person's time if they want to strengthen their own muscles. There aren't medical therapies to help with the typical post prostatectomy incontinence, and that's because it is a muscular phenomenon, and there's not a medication that can strengthen that muscle. So when we're moving down the line of therapies, I do talk to patients about there are devices that are available that can go on the outside of the penis or collect urine under, under, the, under your clothing. I have a few patients in my practice who find those devices useful, but it's, it's not that many. Uh, but I certainly offer those. We have them available, and I think it's, it's certainly worth a try because it's minimally invasive. And it can be useful either throughout the day or just at certain times when leakage might occur, say, at the gym or things like that. So, and then finally moving beyond exercising your own muscles, using external device, is talking about surgical therapies. There are two surgical therapies to correct post-prostatectomy incontinence. There's a sling and the artificial urinary sphincter. The sling is a static device. It's kind of like a hammock that support, supports the urethra. It's placed through an incision in the perineum, which is the flat area between the scrotum and the anus. In general, that's a, a lesser part of my practice, partly because I see a lot of patients who've had both prostatectomy and radiotherapy as part of my practice. And I don't feel that slings are particularly useful in patients who've had radiotherapy. Uh, I also feel that in general, when patients are wanting a surgical therapy to correct their incontinence, that I can get them more continent with the artificial sphincter. The artificial sphincter is a really interesting device that's been on the market. Well, it's developed in the 1970s by an American company. And it was the engineers sort of tinkered with things through about the mid-80s to improve the device, and it's been pretty static since about the mid-1980s, which means we have a number of decades of data on the device, not, an not really an evolving device. And in terms of the, you know, what is felt about this device, over 90% of patients are improved and would recommend the device to someone that they like. So it's important to qualify that. Um, in terms of, that does not mean that the device makes someone perfect. I always say I cannot make you as perfect as you were before your, your therapy, but the huge majority of patients are improved with the device. And whether that's continence, meaning not wearing any pads, or control wearing one thin pad a day. The device itself is placed surgically, again through a perineal incision, which is a small incision between the scrotum and the anus. That's where the urethra is curving up behind your pubic bone to reach the bladder. And that's where the artificial muscle portion of the device is placed. So basically we're putting, you had two rings of muscle, one was lost, now you're regaining two rings of muscle in series with one muscle being artificial. I can, you know, we don't have the technology yet to hook that muscle up to your brain. I assume this will come at some point, but it's not here now. And so there's a second small incision made below the umbilicus where a reservoir that puts a consistent amount of pressure on the artificial muscle is placed. And then the third portion of the device is a small control pump that's under the skin of the scrotum. So when you look at yourself in the mirror, you'd look the, the very same, but under the skin of the scrotum next to the testicle is the control pump. 
when you're wanting to void, you're standing in front of the toilet, you compress the side of the scrotum where that, uh, where that control pump is. That opens up the artificial muscle for about 45 seconds, allows voiding, and the artificial muscle closes on its own. If you needed to void more, you'd just press it again. So uh, this device does work about as well as anything in terms of regaining control of urinary function. There are some things that can, that can happen with, with the device. Just like any artificial device, if it becomes infected, it has to be removed through those incisions. The device can then be replaced if the, if the person wants it. Infection rates are somewhere under about 5%. Um, the device itself has a mechanical lifetime and so has to be replaced at some point. Uh, typically, replacement is between 8 and 12 years. And when the device reaches its mechanical limit, what happens is the small amount of IV fluid that's creating the pressure in the device leaks out into the person's body, which is inconsequential, and the device fails in the open position, meaning the person begins leaking again. It can't fail in the closed position, which is good. Um, so those, that's the, those are the primary things I talk to patients about who've had a prostatectomy. The other group of patients that I see fairly commonly are patients who've had radiotherapy. And I realize these two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. But patients, if we're talking about patients who have had only radiotherapy, I see a variety of uh, concerns. And they fall primarily into the irritative symptoms, and this is similar to what I was talking about before, where patients are going, more frequent, going to the bathroom more frequently than they'd like to with sig significant urgency, uh, and sometimes even leaking urine due to that urgency. And then the other group of symptoms are the obstructive symptoms. You know, my flow is very slow. I'm not emptying my bladder fully. I have to really strain to push the urine out. In evaluating those two groups of patients, and they also both can happen at the same time in the same patient. So I do uh, recommend frequently urodynamics studies, which allow me to see, okay, what is the bladder muscle doing? And how much overactivity is present? How strong is the bladder contraction? How much loss of elasticity of the bladder has the patient seen through radiation? And then with the obstructive symptoms, how, uh, how slow is the flow uh, and, and how well are they able to empty their bladder? When I, in terms of dealing with the irritative symptoms, those can be treated in a variety of ways. Pelvic floor muscle training actually can often help. Activating the muscles of the pelvic floor has a relax, sends a relaxing message to the muscle of the bladder. And so that can uh, provide a, a calming uh, reflex to the bladder. Medications, there are a number of different kinds of medications that can provide calming, uh, calm, calming influence to the bladder. And again, in some patients, Botox injections to the bladder or even something called an interstim, which is a, a bladder pacemaker. So there are a number of options for those patients. Now, on the other side, the obstructive symptoms it is in some ways more difficult to deal with. When the prostate has been radiated, it becomes less elastic, and so it can be obstructive. In patients who have not been radiated, that can be treated with surgical procedures to open the inside of the prostate. That is done endoscopically through the urethra, a transurethral resection of prostate. For patients who've seen radiation, unfortunately the prostate doesn't heal quite as well, and that surgery can have an increased risk of both urinary incontinence and scarring developing in the prostate. So it, a very thoughtful decision has to be undertaken for patients who are seeing obstructive symptoms after radiation. Uh, and patients, of course, can have both symptoms. They can have irritative and obstructive symptoms. In general, the obstructive symptoms need to be managed first because if someone... Uh, if I'm doing things to relax and calm the bladder and the person is already obstructed, I'm going to put them into urinary retention, which is obviously not the goal of, of, the, uh, of whatever therapy we're doing. In terms of, uh, you know, patients who have both had a prostatectomy and had radiotherapy, you can have the whole gamut of what I've described in terms of urinary symptoms. And again, often urodynamics can be very helpful in terms of seeing what is your bladder doing. There's no longer a prostate, but has, is there scar tissue that's developed within the urethra that needs to be treated? 
and then bladder calming agents, and then dealing with continence. And so for some patients who've, who've had all of these therapies, it's necessary to, to walk down the road that we've described the, the entire way through what's the, uh, what is the function of the bladder, what is the health of the urethra and bladder, and how can we get the person back to what their goal is. When I sit down with a patient, one of the first things I like to talk about is where are you now and where would you like to be? What is the goal, your goal in seeing me? So that we can hopefully, uh, through these different evaluations and treatment, move to as close to that goal as, they, as, as we can possibly get. Thank you for your attention.